welcome to the Flight Bridge Ed podcast series. Hey guys, Eric back with you with Flight Bridge Ed. Today we're going to talk about a, another case study. We did a case study uh, called The Nightmare Patient about three, four weeks ago. We got a lot of downloads off of that. It seemed like people really enjoyed that. I know teaching-wise, uh, applying patient scenarios, case studies in your presentation is, is kind of the new way to present uh, any type of critical care or just standard medicine um, lecture. So I think that we're going to start doing more and more of these case studies, trying to apply our critical care uh, pathophysiology uh, to these case studies, and I think it's uh, much easier to, to learn in that way. So today we're going to talk about kind of another nightmare patient, and it's going to be regarding ARDS. Remember, ARDS stands for Adult Respiratory Distress Syndrome, and this is a, a big problem that we see in our ICU patients. And it's it happens for multiple reasons. Um, a few reasons uh, that we, we see is in the past we've used really high tidal volumes. And, and if you've heard my earlier podcasts on ventilator management and the, the – ARDSNET study that, that I discussed, we, we looked at using lower tidal volumes versus higher tidal volumes. And, you know, 10, 15 years ago, high tidal volumes, 10 to 15 mils per kilogram were, were the standard. And what was happening is we were causing ventilator lung injury. We were causing tissue cytokines to start attacking the cells and, and attacking the epithelial tissues and causing this inflammatory response that started attacking the lungs, um, decreases Vascular permeability starts pushing this fluid into the interstitial spaces of the lungs, uh, fills the alveoli up, and you start having ARDS. And because of this, your alveoli are filled with this nasty fluid. There's no gas exchange happening through the alveolar membrane because you have this big shunt, and we start uh, becoming very hypoxic because of that. Hypoxia leads to uh, anaerobic metabolism, um, cellular death, and, and then if this is prolonged and this isn't something that can be reversed because of how severe the, the presentation is, then your patient dies from this. So the ARDSNET study, is, as I've stated in earlier podcasts, is a group of clinicians that have done uh, research. They founded this website, and it's all about trying to reduce the incidence of ARDS, ventilator lung injury, by using proper ventilator strategies. Now, we know that any patient that has any type of medical problem, insult, um, if, if we're talking about a simple MI or are we talking about a trauma patient, these patients can have an inflammatory response based on that problem. Um, and we see this all the time. And so as far as advanced certification review, the, the type of scenario that you may see question-wise is you're going to have a, a normal patient that maybe just had surgery, and all of a sudden they're, they're starting to have respiratory distress, um, they're, they're maybe tachypnic, and they do an ABG, and they're acidotic, and they're hypoxic. So their PO2 is low, and really there's no other um, uh, um, reason why that PO2 would be low. And that should immediately clue you in that there's something starting at the lung, lung level where you're possibly having a uh, inflammatory response and secondary ARDS. And so I thought it would be fitting today to, to use a very sick uh, patient that was an actual flight. Um, we'll talk about this patient. We'll go into the pathophysiology related to this and to kind of dissect it down. And I think it will be very fitting because it applies to the last three or four podcasts that we've, we've done. We've, we've done a podcast on oxygenation and ventilation. So we can apply that. We did, we did a podcast on – we did a podcast on – gas laws and how that relates to our patient care. And so we can apply Henry's law, we can apply Dalton's law um, to this uh, type of patient. And then there's aspects of hemodynamic uh, instability to it, so we can kind of apply uh, earlier podcasts where we talked about different pressors and things like that. All right, so let's get started. Um, you're dispatched to, to a transfer. Um, you have a small uh, facility in eastern Kentucky that has um, requested your helicopter service to come fly a patient about an hour, hour and 15 minutes to a level one ICU. You have a 55-year-old male patient that has been diagnosed with H1N1 flu, and he has secondary sepsis um, uh, associated with that H1N1 and uh, possible ARDS. He's currently intubated. He's been intubated and on the ventilator for about three days. He is um, 
on a mode of CMV. So remember, CMV is controlled mandatory ventilation. Um, he's at a tidal volume of 600. He's at a respiratory rate or a frequency of 12. He has an FiO2 of 40% and a PEEP of 10. All right. And his ideal body weight is 100 kilos. Current vital signs, his blood pressure is 76 over 40. His heart rate is 130. He has an O2 sat of 71%. Um, you are given a, a set of AVGs that were obtained about two hours ago, and his current pH is 7.10. His PaCO2 of 60, he's got a bicarb of 16, and he's got a PaO2 of 40. Um, the RN tells you that he's on a dopamine drip at 20 mics per kilogram a minute. All right, so let's kind of break down this scenario. Let's break down the different things real quick before we start talking about what we can do to maybe correct or change um, what's going on with this patient uh, as far as ventilator strategy, um, the vital signs, the blood pressure, and maybe the pressors. So this flight happened a few years ago. I've, I've kept this uh, flight because it was such a, a sick patient and such a challenging case. Um, and it was in, during the time where H1N1 was a really big deal, and we were seeing a lot of young um, to middle-aged um, adults um, suffering and dying from this disease process. So let's talk about ventilator strategy here. We've got a 55-year-old male patient. He's on CMV, and, and if you remember from my earlier podcast, I'm a big um, component on never using CMV. There's really no use um, for that mode of ventilation. It's very barbaric in my mind. Again, this is my opinion, and I feel like there's there's much better modes of delivery for ven ventilator-dependent uh, patients, uh, specifically using SIMV as, as your main underlying mode. His tidal volume is 600, so ideal body weight if we wanted to go low. Remember, when we have a patient that has a lung injury, has ARDS, we want to use the lowest tidal volume as possible. And so we got to think about what's going to protect that lung. And protecting that lung is volume. So by lowering the volume as low as possible and making sure we have a corresponding respiratory rate that's going to maintain a good minute ventilation, you're actually protecting that lung. So if we went low on the tidal volume, we could go 4 to 6 mils per kilogram. And I would use the 4 mils per kilogram on an ARDS patient. So 4 um, mils per kilogram times the uh, 100 kilograms tidal volume should be about 400 on this patient. So he's at a 600 tidal volume. All right. Respiratory rate of 12. Again, if we're going low tidal volumes, we have to raise that respiratory rate. And if you remember, we use the calculation of 120 cc's a kilogram a minute. That gives you a minute ventilation that accounts for dead space, allows the patient to be ventilated minute ventilation wise very effectively and you maintain eucapnia. Remember eucapnia is the definition for maintaining a CO2 range that's normal. All right. All right. So we should probably lower that tidal volume to 400. We would raise that respiratory rate or frequency up to probably 18 or 20 to counterbalance that that minute ventilation since we're dropping that tidal volume so low. FiO2 of 40 percent. Remember the big aspect of FiO2. When we have a chronic patient, we have a patient that's been on the ventilator. We have a patient that is already suffering from an inflammatory cascade and response. They have a big surge response because right, we're, they're already in sepsis. They're uh, in septic shock because they have been um, they, they haven't responded to fluid replacement. They're still hypotensive. He's compensating with a heart rate that's 130, which could be secondary to also the dopamine being so high. So we'll talk about that. But we have an FiO2 of 40%, and, and we know that high concentrations of FiO2 for prolonged periods of time also cause inflammatory cascades. They also release free radicals. Those free radicals start breaking down the epithelial tissues, breaking down the, cyto uh, the cytosol in the cell, and we know that that weakens that, that tissue and, and causes a breakdown, and that's a bad thing. But if we look at this patient, his PaO2 is 40, all right? So he's very hypoxic. So I would say that initially, to try to get his SAT up, I would say initially, because his FiO2 is 40%, we should probably increase that FiO2 to 100%, and we can always dial that back down. But we need to do whatever we can to try to optimize oxygenation. All right, so let's apply 
a gas law that we talked about earlier. The gas law that, that pertains, the most important gas law that we can use in critical care medicine is, is Henry's Law. Henry's Law states, remember, that the amount of gas is directly proportional to the pressure above that gas in a solution. So we can apply that in three ways. The first thing we do is we increase concentration. Remember my analogy, we have all this O2 molecules floating around in the blood. If we increase the concentration and we add 100% to that, now we have a, a cup of blood that's filled with O2 molecules. All right. The second thing we need to do is we need to increase that surface area. So we pour that same amount of blood into a larger area. So we pour it into a pot, let's say. Now we have all this surface area that we're able to oxygenate more efficiently. If we apply that to this patient, and we said that because of the vascular permeability in the lungs has, has decreased, and we have all this fluid that has filled the alveoli, that alveoli is filled with this nasty junk, and there's no way for oxygen to diffuse through that solution very well and diffuse in through the alveolar membrane and onto the hemoglobin and into the plasma. All right, so you just have you have this massive shunt. So if we increase that surface area, we improve the area for gas exchange, then we're in, going to in turn improve oxygenation. All right, so we're going to increase the concentration. That's going to be increasing the FiO2 from 40% to 100% initially. And then we've got to look at how we're going to increase that surface area. Now, his PEEP is already at 10. And this is where we kind of have to get into some controversy. A lot of you guys that are listening have medical directors that are very cautious about PEEP. And I would probably argue that most of your, your protocols are stating that you can only go up to 10, maybe 15 a PEEP without calling for, for medical direction. All right, and, and they're doing that because they're protecting their license. You know, there, there's there's studies out there that have shown that if you increase PEEP to certain levels, that you're going to increase interthoracic pressure, you're going to decrease venous return, and you're going to in turn cause um, a a rebound hypotension. Okay, there's also many studies out there that I can quote. You know, if you want to email me, uh, I can give you where they have done uh, studies and they've looked at ICP, they've looked at interthoracic pressures. And they've used extremely high peeps. What I'll tell you that all the research is showing is that by using low tidal volumes, by increasing your peeps, you're actually going to have better overall gas exchange. You're going to have a decreased incidence of ventilator lung injury, uh, ARDS, and things like that. All right. So we already have a PEEP of 10, and he's already hypotensive. And so I know a lot of you are going to be uncomfortable with, man, I've always been taught if I increase PEEP higher, I'm going to drop my blood pressure even low. And, and you're, you're right to a point, but how can we augment this blood pressure? All right, so we have to look at two things here. We've got to increase the PEEP because we have to do something with the surface area, but we have a low blood pressure. And so this is where we kind of have to do things uh, simultaneously. He's on a dopamine drip at 20 mics a kilogram a minute. We know that dopamine at that rate, that that dose is counterproductive. He's It's causing a tachycardia. Remember, if you look at your diastolic pressure, your diastolic pressure is two-thirds of your MAP. And so what that means is you have to allow for diastolic filling. Diastolic filling is essential for propelling that volume out of the out of the heart and, and, and through the body and that is going to improve oxygenation it's going to improve cardiac output and things like that if your heart rate's going so fast that you're not allowing your your ventricle to fill during diastole then you're you're causing a, a counterproductive uh, state so we need to get rid of this dopamine and we need to switch to something that's going to cause an alpha squeeze that's going to decrease the effects on the heart. And that would be probably levofed or neosinephrine. Either one of those two would be absolutely appropriate. So that's what I would do immediately. I would, I would, I would slowly turn down the dopamine. I wouldn't shut it off yet. I would add levofed, and I would, I would start titrating up the levofed. As I titrated up the levofed, I would drop the dopamine down. And eventually I would take that dopamine off, all right? So that's how we're going to augment this blood pressure. That's how we're going to protect this blood pressure, all right? So 76 over 40, we would want to calculate a MAP pressure based on, on that. We would want to try to maintain a MAP pressure around 60 to 65. And once I got the levofed on board, we, we could start looking at increasing the PEEP, all right? So let's increase the PEEP now to 15 and see what we have. 
And I can tell you, based on this patient, increasing the PEEP to 15 didn't really improve the O2 set that, that much. I think the O2 set went from a 71 to maybe a 76, 77 percent. All right, and that's after increasing FiO2 to f from 40 percent to 100 percent and improving um, our, our PEEP from 10 to 15, we did have a corresponding rise in SATs from 71 to 77 percent. So what do we do now? Do we increase PEEP more? And this is where, again, you've got to think about uh, the controversy involved. You have a referring physician at, at, at that hospital, and it's very easy to go to that physician and say, hey, I think this patient would benefit from a higher PEEP. You know, he's got ARDS, he's in severe sepsis, he's extremely hypoxic, nothing else is working. Do you care if we increase the PEEP up to a certain point? And that would be a way around, you know, your, your protocols is if you get a written order before you leave that facility. So what are some other things that could be causing this problem or could, could be causing a patient to um, be this unstable and not respond to these strategies? Remember, we, we started with the mode of CMV, and we, we need to switch that to SIMV. We need to look at his sedation and pain management. And if I remember correctly, this patient's sedation and pain management was very inadequate. And that was why he was retaining so much CO2 because he was breath stacking and he was having all this auto peep because of the mode he was on and because of the poor sedation and pain management. So again, the argument comes in, do we give pain management and sedation with a blood pressure that low? And I, and I would argue, yes, we do. There should never be any patient that should uh, have sedation and pain management withheld because of the blood pressure. We have to treat that. That could be causing that low blood pressure. If, if your patient is so... Um, uncomfortable, that their metabolic rate is increasing, that they're using all this O2 demand um, because they're in so much pain, you've got to deal with that. You've got to treat that. And so treating that with fentanyl, fentanyl is going to be a great medication in this, in this um, circumstance because it's not going to have a profound effect on blood pressure. You could even go with ketamine. Ketamine would be another excellent medication that's hemodynamically stable that would give you some analgesic effects. It would give you um, some sedation effects and be very good for this patient. So let's deal with that. So if you look at this, we're doing a lot of things at one time. We're dealing with the pain. We're dealing with the sedation. We're switching from CMV to SIMV. We've, we've dropped our tidal volume from 600 to 400. We've increased our frequency from 12 to 18. We've increased our FIO2 from 40 to 100%. So we're doing a lot of things. This is where this patient is extremely complex. And we've increased our PEEP from uh, 10 to 15. So what do we do now? Well, we need to keep increasing that PEEP up because if you look at Henry's Law, if you don't have the surface area for gas exchange, then you're not going to have gas exchange. And maybe for this patient, based on his physiology, based on his disease process, maybe he needs more PEEP. And so let's, uh, for, for the sake of arguments, let's increase his PEEP up to 20. All right. So now we have Levofed going. Uh, we've got um, our dopamine off, and we have an increase in blood pressure to 86 over 44. And so that's a pretty significant increase, and, and I'm, I'm pretty pleased with that. We've seen a drop in heart rate down to about 105 to 110, and we're seeing O2 two sats now in the 85% range. And so at this point, you know, you have to make a decision. Do you, uh, do you stay on scene? Do you st increase your bedside times, or is it time to load and go? And we, we chose, once we got our patient uh, somewhat stable, uh, we, we had the O2 sats increased a little bit, we chose to uh, take off of this patient. What we ended up doing is we ended up increasing the PEEP up to 25 we added on pressure support because remember in SIMV the patient has the option of of over breathing the vent, um, and so we would augment augment that over breathing that spontaneous breath with pressure support, and that's what we did. So we added pressure support of 25 to 30 on this patient. So let's recap our vent settings now. We are in an SIMV mode. We are um, in uh, volume. We are at a tidal volume of 400, we're at a rate of 18, we're on FIO2 100%, and we're at a PEEP of 20. 
At this point, we identified based on his plateau pressures. We, we checked plateau pressures. His plateau pressures were remaining above 30, above the norm. We, we recognized that this was, you know, a, a, a poor and ominous thing for, for our patient's lungs. So we chose to switch from volume to pressure. And so if you remember from earlier podcasts, we talked about the differences between volume um, ventilation versus pressure ventilation. When you look at pressure control ventilation, what you're doing is you're setting a pressure based on his current PIP and PEEP, and you're basically trying to inflate the lung to that pressure. Based on the chest wall compliance, the lung will inflate to a certain volume. And so for him, we started at a pressure of 25. We were able to get volumes around 400, and we saw an Im immediate improvement in our patients' um, O2 sats and um, you know just how comfortable he was on the ventilator. And so by increasing, or I should say by switching from volume to pressure, what we did is we turned a, a – a volume uh, delivery mode of ventilation to a pressure mode of ventilation, which was very uh, good based on his disease process and chest wall compliance. Because his chest wall compliance was poor, his lungs were very sick, and, and a pressure control ventilation mode of delivery is excellent for those sick, weak baby lungs. So based on everything we've done, we started seeing O2 sats start climbing from 85 to 88 to 92, after about an hour flight, we were we were seeing O2 sats in the 96% range, and we started seeing blood pressure start increasing accordingly. To where, when we were about 10 minutes out, we started seeing the blood pressure about 110 over over 70s, and we started thinking, we started asking ourselves, has this increase in blood pressure been secondary to our pressors? Um, having the, the levofed on, we turned the dopamine off. I believe we even added dobutamine once we got a blood pressure up to a certain level. Remember, dobutamine is added only once you have a blood pressure that is adequate, that could handle the initial vasodilation caused from that medication. And what we, what we tried to do is we started titrating off those pressors. So Remember, we dropped the dopamine, we increased the levofed, we added dobutamine. Now we're starting to titrate those medications off. And so we did that. By the time we landed, we had turned off the levofed, we had turned off the dobutamine. And based on fixing the oxygenation problem, we improved hemodynamic um, status. We improved the blood pressure from a very hypotensive, hypoxic patient. And now we delivered a patient that was hemodynamically stable. His O2 sat was appropriate, and he was comfortable. He was on a mode of ventilation that was comfortable for him. We dealt with his pain and sedation. And so if you can look at this big picture, we dealt with every aspect of his clinical picture. We just didn't deal with one thing. We looked at the big picture. We had a good team approach. I was working with a great nurse. And we looked at everything, and we dealt with every facet of his problem. And so it taught me a lot of things. It taught me that if you are aggressive with your um, oxygenation, if you're aggressive with dealing with the simple thing of oxygen diffusion through that alveolar membrane, a lot of times you're going to have improvement hemodynamically. Now, I know that there's patients out there that you may never improve the blood pressure. They may be so sick so far gone that, that it may not work. But I believe that oxygenation drives everything, and that's the whole principle um, and uh, definition of the FIC principle. We have to look at oxygen demand and oxygen delivery. We have to make those two things match. And so we always can go back to delivering oxygenation in the right way, and we can always apply Henry's Law and think about increasing concentration, improving the surface area, and then applying the pressure. And that's exactly what we did. We improved um, the FiO2 from 40 to 100%. We applied a sufficient amount of PEEP based on his disease process. We went from 10 to 25, which I know is a huge jump in PEEP. That's a massive number. But he handled it fine. His blood pressure increased. We augmented that blood pressure with a presser that caused great alpha squeeze. We decreased the dopamine, which decreased the heart rate. That caused great diastolic filling and allowed for better cardiac output. And we improved his overall status by doing everything. We dealt with his pain and his sedation. So 
this is a, a very, very sick patient. This is a very challenging patient. I know that I've had um, many people, uh, I just taught at a conference, uh, and I had many people come up to me and ask me questions related to this exact patient. And so I thought it would be fitting to kind of throw this scenario out there. That's all I have today. I hope that this patient scenario, this presentation was something that that we can all learn from, that it was uh, something that answers a lot of questions for a lot of people. Don't be afraid of, to add PEEP. Don't be afraid to be aggressive in that manner. Don't be afraid to be aggressive with fixing that oxygenation. But think about the big picture. Think about everything that you can do, everything that's actually causing the problem. Look at the big picture and identify and fix those problems one by one. So again, we want to thank everybody for following us on Twitter, following us on Facebook. We've had many, many people um, uh, order our, our new book, so we want to thank you for that, and uh, we will see you soon. We want to thank you for following Flatbridge Edge.